Okay, great. Good evening. Um, I'm Robin D.G. Kelly. Uh, I teach history uh, and Black Studies at UCLA, um, and I am honored to be here to serve as moderator for what promises to be a very critical, uh, urgent conversation, actually. And like all of the extraordinary Haymarket events, you know, I really want to thank the folks at Haymarket, especially my friend Anthony Arnoff, for creating the space for serious conversations on the left about where we are, you know, how we got here, and where we might be going. So here I'm joined with, by uh, three brilliant revolutionary scholars. I say revolutionary first because they're all activists, they're all making movement, and they're scholars, great intellectuals, and they will uh, address the themes uh, this evening of Notes from the Twilight, Meditations on Crisis, Catastrophe, and Genocide. And the title, just so you know, comes from Derek Walcott's essay, What the Twilight Says, which is largely about theater and the challenges of capturing the truths of black life and resistance under regimes of racial capitalism. And he, he writes, quote, the noblest are those who are trapped, who have accepted the twilight, which really speaks to the various turning points, the interregnums between old and new forms of, of oppression and domination and the possibility of rupture. Uh, but the focus on crisis, catastrophe and genocide, uh, that focus is also about moving beyond catastrophe as a series of singular events rather than thinking about the condition. Uh, crisis is not always about opportunity, but a kind of limit experience across different temporalities by different peoples. Uh, and genocide is grounded in uh, racial universalizing logics that actually don't necessarily include us. <laughs> but they will also talk about death and life and struggle and I hope the future. Um, and that's that's my my wish because the you know all three are great thinkers about where to go. Uh, our first speaker is Zoe Samudzi, uh, who is a doctoral candidate in medical sociology at the University of California, San Francisco. Uh, her research engages colonial biomedicine, visuality, German colonialism in the 1904 to 1908 Herero and Nama genocide in German Southwest Africa which is, you know, is present day in Namibia. Uh, her writings have appeared in the New Inquiry, uh, The New Republic, Art in America, Hyperallergic, and Arts uh, Black. And uh, she's a contributing writer to Jewish Currents. Uh, and along with William C. An Anderson, she's a co-author of As Black as Resistance, Finding the Conditions for Our Liberation, AK Press, you could download it, get the Kindle version. It's a, it's a really important book. After that, uh, we will hear uh, from S.A. Smythe, uh, my colleague here, a poet, translator, and scholar of Black European literary and cultural studies and Black trans poetics uh, uh, in, in Black studies. In, um, uh, let's see, they are deeply invested in the coalitional project of Black life, Black study, and relishing other non-binary experiences across the diaspora. Uh, Dr. Smythe is completing two books currently, Where Blackness Meets the Sea, on crisis, culture in the Black Mediterranean, and a collection of poetry titled Proclivity, which focuses on a familial history of Black migration in between Britain, Costa Rica, and Jamaica, trans embodiment and emancipation Dr. Smythe is editor of a forthcoming special issue of postmodern culture titled Troubling the Grounds, Global Configurations of Blackness, Nativism, and Indigeneity. And their essays have appeared in many publications, too many to name, but I just name a few, Transgender Studies, Quarterly, uh, Palimpsest, Middle East Report, Postcolonial Studies, National Political Science Review, Critical Ethnic Studies, The Feminist Wire, Johann Johannesburg Salon, to name a few. Uh, and finally, last but not least, we're going to hear from uh, Bador Al Alagra, uh, it, who's assistant professor uh, in the Department of African and African Diaspora Studies at the University of Texas, Austin. Uh, her forthcoming book, The Interminable Catastrophe, uh, a book that actually frames a lot of our discussion this evening. Um, 
in the internal catastrophe, fatal liberalisms, plantation logics, and black political life in the wake of disaster. Uh, the book charts a conceptual history of catastrophe as a political category or concept emerging in the early uh, modern, emerging in early modern natural science and crystallizing as a concept on the plantation. Critiquing Anthropocene studies in a discourse of imminent disaster, Dr. Alagra, uh, Alagra um, can I see here, instead considers these occurrences as expressions of the durability of plantation modes of social relations, rendering them political uh, conjunctures rather than ecological events. A scholar of African and afro diasporic uh, radical thought, her essays have appeared in several journals, including Critical Ethnic Studies, Contemporary Political Theory, uh, the CLR James Journal, in Souls, and she co-edits with Anthony Bogues the Black Critique book series at Pluto Press, and is co-editor of a volume on Black political thought and another volume on Sylvia Winter's unpublished essays. Um, so, without saying anything else, uh, we're going to hear uh, in that order. We're going to first hear from Zoe. All right. Um, thank you so much. I'm really excited to have this conversation with the three of you. Um, I'm going to read a little bit from a paper that I've actually been working on um, about um, genocide, about the, the creator of the neologism genocide, Raphael Lemkin, and the kind of anti-Black exception clause to the definition of genocide um, by talking about the We Charge Genocide petition that was issued um, to the United Nations in 1951. The Herero and Nama's genocide's claim uh, to uniqueness is in its firstness. Historians largely agree that it is the first genocide of the 20th century. But even in this uniqueness, its firstness is not sufficient to unsettle the foundational nature of indigenous African genocide on the continent, including the foundational to, moder to modernity transatlantic trafficking and trade in enslaved indigenous African people. How can a necessary death then constitute an acute crisis of genocide recognition? Blackness exists within the subontological realm where human being is so attempting to correct and disalienate the subject and also to understand the complete trajectory from full indigenous personhood and sovereignty to native colonial subject to post-genocide indigenous subject means we must refuse this universality and an Africanness as opposed to blackness that exists solely in relationship to Eurocoloniality. So useful to examine in this response, because that was really like heady and a lot and maybe doesn't mean that much, is the response to We Charge Genocide, the crime of government against the Negro people, which was a petition written by the Civil Rights Congress and presented to the United Nations meeting in Paris at the end of 1951. In the petition, the CRC and its signatories charged the U.S. government, or sorry, it's, this is a quote, charged the U.S. government with mass murder of its own nationals, with institutionalized oppression and persistent slaughter of Negro people in the United States on the basis of race, a crime abhorred by mankind and by the conscience, the conscience of the world, and indeed criminalized by the Genocide Convention of 1951. There are two main arguments for this charge then. The first is, um, per the convention's language, killing members of the group, a violation of Article 2. And as evidence they offer, killings by police, killings by incited gangs, killings at night by masked men, killings always on the basis of race, and killings by the Ku Klux Klan, despite the universal citizenship that ought to have been afforded to them by the Constitution. The second that they cite is an economic genocide, or using the convention's language, deliberately inflicting on the group conditions of life calculated to bring about its destruction in whole or in part. The petition outlines the creation and maintenance of conditions that are so egregious that the American Negro is deprived when compared with the remainder of the population of the United States of eight years of life on the average. It describes how, how the violence of the transatlantic slave trade and the indignity of the Southern plantation system begot exploitative sharecropping and Jim Crow segregation and, and how that forced black Americans into quote city ghettos or their rural equivalents 
and into filthy disease-bearing housing and deprived by law of adequate medical care and education. These combined violences are made possible by, quote, the emasculation of democracy, the structural prevention of Black Americans from voting and organizing, and, quote, the dividing of the whole American people, emasculating mass movements for democracy, and securing, securing the grip of predatory reactions on the federal, state, county, and city government level, which, of course, all sounds incredibly familiar. The petition was both a foundational articulation of the Black Freedom Movement's use of the then, of the then new anti-genocide norm, and it also serves as a useful example of the ontological and analytical limits of the international definition of genocide. This petition, most crucially, um, utilizes the criminalization of genocide, which is a crime targeting individuals and communities explicitly because of their group membership, as a means of contesting the maintenance of racial hierarchies. Quote, accusations of genocide reprised a vocabulary designed to challenge the suppression and destruction of minority life which of course presented the particular concern that an international law against genocide would challenge existing state and non-state practices designed to maintain white supremacy. The petition also had disconcerting, at least to hegemonic powers, international implications because it offered the possibility for the genocide convention to be applied to contest racial discrimination internationally which is a frame articulated by the petition's, quote, solemn warning that a nation which practices genocide against its own nationals may not long be, deter be deterred um, to, to do so elsewhere. They invoked the Du Boisian problem of the color line, which was politicized in such a way that it linked the racial terror of the lynch mob directly to more organized campaigns of colonial warfare. Um, which is critical because, you know, a critique of imperialism is conspicuously absent from the Universal Declaration of, of Human Rights. And unsurprisingly, the petition was poorly received in the United States. But I, I think that the most notable rejection of its legitimacy comes from Raphael Lemkin himself. In a 1953 letter to the editor of the New York Times, Lemkin reemphasizes the rarity and sociopolitical magnitude of genocide describing not only the tens of millions of lives lost in the 20th century, but also the gravity and necessity of the serious mental harm provisions of the convention. He characterizes the petitioners as, quote, opponents of the genocide convention rather than individuals actually seeking to broaden its scope. And he questions whether one can, quote, be guilty of genocide when one frightens a Negro because fear alone cannot be considered as serious mental harm and the acts of intimidation were never directed against the entirety of the Negro population of the country. Previously, in 1949, he'd corresponded with U.S. Representative Emanuel Seller, who offered considerations about potential obstacles for the U.S. ratification of the convention, including basically, you know, whether a genocide charge could be brought against a signatory country in the case of a lynch mob, say, in, for example, Mississippi. The answer um, although it would yield some sovereignty on behalf of the United States, could be yes. In the same correspondence, the representative claimed that lynchers do not seek to destroy a racial group, but rather simply to intimidate the blacks. And in a response to Lemkin's op-ed, Oakley C. Johnson, a social activist and a member of the Communist Party of the U.S., wrote that Lemkin's characterization of fright is grossly insufficient for describing actions intended to incite race hate and to terrorize an entire group of uh, an entire racial group, um, and to maintain the existence of an anti-black status quo. Lemkin concludes by writing: the conflation of genocide with the injustice of discrimination besmirches the good name of some democratic societies, which might be unjustly slandered in the name of accusing genocide. So we might understand Lemkin's trivializing response to the petition through the vein of anti-blackness which is consistent also in his writings about the Herero and Nama genocide. While colonialism was foundational to his theorizations of genocide, he writes about the Spanish colonization of the Americas, um, and also you know, incredibly formative to his work is the Ottoman Turkish genocide of Armenians and um, Assyrians and Greek Orthodox um, communities. Um, he, 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 the way that he writes about African colonization contains pretty substantial and even um, kind of idea undermining contradictions. 
In writing about the Herero um, and the Nama genocide, he attributes the state, uh, the German state's cruelty to an improper practice of colonial rule, that they should have opted for the British system of indirect rule, which would have allowed for indigenous cultural maintenance um, and um, a greater use of native administration, which would have been more humane. Um, and in line with other kind of historiographic theses that emphasize the kind of exceptional cruelty of German administration, he says that the, the suppressions of Herrera Rebellion are just simply a result of Prussian militarism, which is a really ahistorical um, assessment and actually overstates the function and efficiency of imperial German administration, which didn't really begin in seriousness until after the genocide had ended in 1908. While he does not retroactively apply his, his term genocide to the context of Herrero suffering, his own description of the Herrero Wars would have undoubtedly fit the criteria that he created. Yet his analysis of the violence does not sufficiently hold European colonialism responsible for the production of genocide making and justifying epistemes and practices. And even further, he perpetuates the racist myth that the Herrero were committing race suicide which is a popular theory that was promoted by Willem Petristeenkamp, um, who claimed the Herero, quote, could not reconcile themselves to the idea of subjection to Germany and thus loss of independence, and basically claimed that they were, they were creating and drinking a particularly strong beer, which just rendered them completely um, ineffectual. Um, in addition to all of this anti-blackness, obviously, Cold War era McCarthyism was a pretty tremendous means of discrediting the CRC's claims, as Paul Robeson famously was um, a part of the group that submitted the petition. He asserts, um, or he often talks about the Russian practice of genocide and how anti-Semitic propaganda under Stalin, quote, matched the efforts of Streicher and Goebbels. And he asserted that Paul Robeson and William L. Patterson um, were falsely accusing the U.S. of genocide to divert U.N. attention from the true genocidal crimes being committed against Soviet-dominated people. As we know, um, the kind of double genocide thesis is another quite common means of, of Holocaust denialism. So additionally, Lemkin's understanding of genocide crimes complemented the Nuremberg precedent that was set just a few years before. Genocide was not to be understood as a long existing structural phenomenon that complemented European colonialism. It was rather an acute flare of violence that was, to, that was perpetrated by a prosecutable group of people. So I'll stop there. Oh, great. Thank you so much. Um, thank you so much to the folks at Haymarket um, for convening this conversation, to Robin for the generosity of spirit that you always carry um, in um, every conversation I've had with you, um, which has been uh, years longer than I've known you um, through your writing. And of course, to Zoe and Vador, who I'm just honored to be sitting near even in virtual space. Um, so I'm just going to read um, a little bit from my forthcoming, can I call it forthcoming? I just did, um, book, Where Blackness Meets the Sea, um, and to talk a little bit about uh, uh, my commitments and investments and what I mean when I talk about the Black Mediterranean. So it's going to start sort of in media res in the middle of the text. But. This capacity of Black literature in Italy toward truth-telling, historical imagination, and political resistance, I believe, is more necessary now when considering the resurgence of fascist populism across Europe slash the West and the Mediterranean Sea's reputation as one of the world's deadliest seas and border crossings, with each year being more murderous than the last. And I'll come back to that point. This reputation has greatly impacted the changing social and legal climate around Italian migration, rights to asylum and Italian citizenship, which continues to alter the state of post-colonial literary production in Italy. Writings in Italian from authors of Ethiopian descent could resist the category of post-colonial on technical and ideological grounds. Um, while Abyssinia was occupied by Italy from 1936 to 41, the territory now known as Ethiopia was, strictly speaking, never colonized by any European power. And we know that every nation state configuration has its own self-narrative, so we can definitely talk about that. 
However, writers like Gabriele Germandi, uh, who is of Italian and Ethiopian descent, reckon directly with the memory and effects of Italian colonialism and occupation. In an interview with Italian studies scholar Daniele Combierati, uh, Germandi touches on the impact of representational regimes of sexuality, gender, and race by marking herself as an act of rupture from and resistance to Italy's imperial and colonial endeavors that impacted her own genealogy, saying, and I did not translate this in advance. Um, Io dico sempre che il colonialismo nella mia famiglia ha creato danni a quattro generazioni di donne e io sono quella che chiude. So, um, uh, I always say that colonialism in my family created four generations of damaged women, but I'm the one that ends it. In my book, I want to suggest that post-colonial writings from Black writers, as well as the engaged literary criticism from Black and post-colonial studies, offer a useful theoretical framework to reflect the heterogeneity inherent in modes of Black belonging and articulates racial difference as central to our understandings of citizenship and identity. This anti-colonial and Afro-diasporic mode of reading is foregrounded by a close engagement with Black Italy and Black Italians, and thereby recognizes that those categories are not, in fact, coterminous. Put another way, Black life in Italy is not solely bound to the concerns of the Italian citizen subject or the citizen in waiting. The latter term used often to refer to those who are made to endure the purgatory of being bestowed certain rights and freedoms through legally afforded citizenship despite having been born in Italy. So when I speak of Black Italy, I am speaking of the lives, histories, cultural productions, and politics of Black Italians, Black migrants, Black undocumented people, Black domestic workers, Black students, Black tourists, Black visitors, Black asylum seekers, and all other configurations of Black people of African descent, I specify of African descent, in relation to geopolitical confines of what we now know as Italy. Black Italian literary texts written in Italian or related dialects by people of African descent, whether they were born or migrated to Italy, that speak to the specific concerns and engagements with Italy and Italianità or uh, Italianness contribute to my understanding of the Black Mediterranean, which I read diasporically, in part for its insights into Black belonging. This is because the Black Mediterranean as a fairly recent category of analysis consider, considers what um, scholar Ida Danavid suggests is the history of racial subordination in the Mediterranean region, which is for many activists, academics, writers, and artists invested there. Uh, this definitively includes the geopolitical space of what we are calling Italy, but even with the focus on certain aspects of the nation, like its policies, borders, cultural production, it also includes, though, the political insights and modes of collective action responding to ongoing racial violence, quote-unquote migration crises, and questions of ethnocultural identification that exceed the nation itself as a case study and provide an emergent frame of possibility to think about Black liberation, its futures, and belonging otherwise, a term that I um, think with from uh, Ashan T. Crawley in Black Pentecostal Breath and definitely elsewhere, um, which I mean here to be beyond state formation. Across centuries and continents, narratives of the arrival of Black people are often found bound to the water or waterways. Blackness and indeed the fear of Blackness or anti-Blackness seem to be below the surface, permeating through everywhere, everywhere, across time and space. When Dion Brand, the God, is what I have in parentheses, so I'm just gonna say that out loud. Uh, Black Canadian poet Dion Brand writes, water is another country. She invokes the power, trauma, and possibility located in that space. Even as that which is liquid at times appears what she calls ubiquitous and mute, the voice of all of our oppressors is the only one left to reverberate. This ubiquity of the water is in part what ties us and binds us in time and spirit to the ontological depths of Black presences in historical and material relation to the Caribbean Sea and to the Atlantic Ocean, the roots of African enslavement and genocide to the Mediterranean Sea. Uh, and this is something that I hope we can also return to, right, when we think about the history of transatlantic slave trade and others, how we somehow choose to leave out what we talk about the Mediterranean Sea and its ongoing sort of um, contemporary and historic um, colonial violence. A helpful provocation here, or that I'd like to offer, is to examine the farce of the recurrent practice of enumeration, of counting people without actually being accountable to them. Such enumeration conforms to the logics of accumulation that structure racial capitalism itself, which of course I get from Cedric Robinson. Uh, 
In the contemporary Mediterranean crossings, the counting of people who die or survive by the International Organization for Migration, or IOM, or various social and mass media entities reveals the quantified abstraction of Black and migrant life and people. This calculated value of Black life is expressed through the state's own language of deficit, death, and debt. Catherine McKittrick calls this the mathematics of unliving. And I think about it in relation to that term as well as death by numbers. Lastly, in the thesis on philosophy of history, Walter Benjamin offers a strategic vision and purpose for radicalism and resistance of presentist narratives. You know, when uh, Paul Gilroy talks about one aspect of European, specifically British racism, racism as uh, relegating black people to the contemporary and the present, and then disavowing and denying the historic presence of black people, life and thought. Benjamin says, the tradition of the oppressed teaches us that, quote, the state of emergency in which we live is not the exception, but the rule. We must attain to a conception of history that accords with this insight. Then we will clearly see that it is our task to bring about a real state of emergency. And this will pr improve our position in the struggle against fascism, he wrote in 2020. One reason fascism has a chance is that in the name of progress, its opponents treat it as a historical norm. The current amazement that the things we are experiencing are still possible in the 20th century is not philosophical. This amazement is not the beginning of knowledge, unless it is the knowledge that the view of history which gives rise to it is untenable. The Black Mediterranean, following the disruptive urging of Benjamin and others, and inspired by the radical legacy, legacy that Cedric Robinson and the creative projects of many of the uh, Italiani Senza Cittadinanza, which are uh, Italians without citizenship, an oxymoron that we would do well to consider, Black Italians, asylum seekers and refugees, lent historical consciousness to the crisis of migration and the politics of belonging. It takes the term crisis literally and etymologically from the Greek word krisis as a turning point, which is what that word means, which acknowledges that the contemporary social disintegration of the calculated cruelty of those in power requires a collective response. In this arsenal of resistance, there is a new politics of naming and new cultural practices of complexity and sustained contradiction that carry within them a more livable destiny for all of us. Ultimately, the struggle for citizenship of second generation or other Italians, um, quote unquote, of color um, or indigenous, for example, like the Romani or Sinti travelers, specifically remains a question of how to resist the seduction of state oriented activism and its identitarian pitfalls. An underlying question embedded in practices of codifying citizenship can be further clarified by black studies, specifically a black studies pursued by queer and trans people. I'm here to ask, what would a politics of citizenship and representation, a radicalized form of Italianita, or indeed its disavowal, look like that would refuse any and all, quote, murderous inclusion? That phrase, murderous inclusion, was coined by trans theorist of color Jin Hwitterborn to describe the depoliticization of queer people under the liberal rubric of gay rights, such as same-sex marriage, over and against possibilities of other rights, or indeed liberation, which is what we're here to do, one would hope. The project of identifying and criticizing murderous inclusion targets those rights upheld or bestowed by the state that result in the politics of queer subordination and the limiting affirmation of policies that are neither queer, liberal, nor beneficial for the most minoritized or radical within a particular impressed, oppressed group. We see this murderous inclusion time and time and time again in the state's disavowal of refugees and asylum seekers and the racist parameters and criteria of citizenship itself. So I'm gonna end with a few questions. Do we want the state to love us or do we want to be free? Is what we're fighting for a conditional citizenship or are we making demands and laying the grounds for our own emancipation? Are we prepared? Are we prepared to take seriously the crisis of this time, not the crisis of the next, that is the never ending crisis of ongoing colonial violence? Truly nothing, no manner of accounting, enumeration or reconcile would be left. Thank you. <laughs> Not the applause. <laughs> Hi, can everyone hear me? Yeah. Oh my goodness. Well, having to follow that is not easy. Um, thanks to uh, all three of you for um, sitting together 
virtually uh, to talk about these things. I was just going to dive right into it um, and not think about it too much. Um, so I've been thinking about the word catastrophe for the greater part of the last seven years. Um, and I dedicated my 2019 dissertation to the question, which has now become my manuscript by the same title, The Interminable Catastrophe. The question that anchors my manuscript, right, following, of course, Kamal Brathwaite's insistence on both the ongoing presence of an original or inaugural moment and the ongoingness, constitutes, I think, the most pressing theory problem concerning catastrophe today. And so my book is both an attempt to frame our current conversations concerning our planetary life, while also refusing that same conversation. Indeed, part of the problem with our thinking concerning this problem um, is the manner in which liberal scientist formulations have remained relatively unchallenged. Um, as such, I offer the interminable book catastrophe as a way to write against the claim that we simply need to believe science or have better science or better mechanics so we might address the problem of our Earth's ecology in its assumed lifespan. We run the risk of complicity with the overdetermination of empirical or social science interpretations and political offerings concerning this problem of ours. Brathwaite, of course, has provided a window, and the interminable catastrophe seeks to inhabit that opening. In my estimation, the contradictory relationship between repetition and the end merits additional exploration. The idea or figuration of the end or the terminal is what makes the internal itself coherent. The end is near, it is in sight, but it's consistently delayed via this repetition. Right? Now, this is not to equate catastrophe with possibility or resistance necessarily, right? But rather, it's an acknowledgement of one of the most puzzling elements, right, of some of the most disastrous occurrences in our colonial modern epoch. People all over the world, through great effort, have managed to live lives, be they degraded, fulfilled, somewhere in between, despite this persistent, delayed, repetitious specter of the end. In my book, I argue that catastrophe is first and foremost a structural condition and a way of life imposed as a form of political and social domination implicated in the New World colonial encounters. In charting a different conceptual history of catastrophe, there are two main constitutive elements that I feel are important and that make up this way of life. The first is that of also drawing from Catherine McKittrick, the breathless numbers, or what Albert Camus calls the cruel mathematics, right? Um, um, that are drawn from circulating discourses of calamity in the works of Georges Cuvier on extinction um, and Malthus, of course, on calamity and scarcity in particular, which I argue instituted an underlying terrestrial relation in which man is antagonistic to the earth and nature itself. Um, and of course, certain forms of life seen as closer to nature's anteriority um, were part of this antagonism. And this anteriority of Africans is expressed in Cuvier's writings on extinction, as we know. This brings me to the second feature of the catastrophic, that of fatal liberalisms and sovereign power. Right? The resignification of the relation between man and the earth as antagonistic meant a need to impose a kind of corrected image of the earth upon the landscape and the social worlds. This correction was carried out via colonization. Right? Nature, right, which by Cuvier's logic concerns the elemental, and which by his own logic as well included the Indian and the African, was now man's enemy in the Schmidian sense, and violent territoriality and rule was the antidote. Where these two paradigms meet in the colony is where the catastrophic stabilizes itself as a category and a concept. Most importantly, both of these constitutive elements of catastrophe um, introduce and stabilize what Sylvia Winter calls a narrative condemnation, right? Clearing a terrain in which the material violences can make themselves appear um, and durable. Of course, Winter's directive that our physical bodies or bios does not precede the story that we tell about those bodies, the mythos, um, then so too for the natural progression of the earth, right? That our physical planet does not precede the story that we tell about it. The problem is certainly physical, but it's also, again, the narrative condemnation that's embedded in the way the story implements itself law likely in our master script. We must, as she begs us, right, as she instructs us, to, we must undo our narratively condemned status if we're to break open the bad infinity of the catastrophic. And so here we have another story of the catastrophic, of a combination of theological and empiricist debates regarding calamity, which then join forces um, with the need to defend ourselves against and in the end destroy the planet. 
I'll first state that considerable and important work has been done to stretch the Anthropocenic frame, right? Including the capitalist scene, the plantationist scene, and more recently, the idea of the Black Anthropocene, right? The interminable catastrophe poses a few questions to this figurative stretching, right? Can we now, having seen the limit, right? Having tugged at it and pressed up against it, right? Cross the threshold to the outside of the Anthropocenic reference point. Can we reach for an autonomous frame that is connected but still outside? Have we exhausted the, Anthrop the Anthropocenic lens? Can we move outside of the question of the Anthropos and away from man's centrality while still maintaining a critique of man's overrepresentation? Right? The space on the other side of the limit of the Anthropocenic lens is where the catastrophic resides, and I am reaching for it. Now, on to the question of the interminable. Now, I want us to consider for a moment Hegel's notion of the infinity, which I, I'm not a Hegelian, right? Um, but I have to do this, right? Because it undergirds much of Western episteme's understanding of continuity and perpetuity. And I think it is instructive for thinking through the Anthropocenic framing of our current problem and the preoccupation with periodization, which I think is a problem, right? Now, Hegel explains this expression of the infinite as a series, right? With each step appearing to take us closer and closer towards infinity. This progression is fundamentally negated because we are no closer to infinity at all. Or to put it otherwise, we never arrive at a point in which infinity is more visible or nearer to us, right? In this way, the infinite is negated by the finite. And as a result, this particular conceptualization of the infinite, right, is comprised of a contradiction insofar as it always contains the finite within it. Uh, this understanding of the infinite, right, which sets itself over and against the idea of the finite is referred to by Hegel as the spurious or the bad infinity, right? Ultimately, for him, this idea of a bad infinity is one that's open-ended, again, setting itself over and against the finite, um, which propels the series forward while also reifying the finite as that against which the infinite renders itself a coherent idea in the first place, right? Now, in an essay titled Terminality, the Ticking, Abu Fairman theorizes the question of terminal terminality within the framework of the doomsday device, or rather midnight on the clock, right? Um, and this, for me, recalls Derrida's argument concerning the invention of clock time as an interruption of life itself, rather than something that connects us um, to livingness. And he says this in his death penalty seminars. Um, Abu Fairman writes the following, that quote, the abstractions of the end, too slow, too vast to be experienced in the present, are transformed into legible futures through the repetition of probabilities, charts, statistics, and temporal frames in which experts produce ever more threatening scenarios and mounting stakes. What was supposed to happen in 2050 is already happening, end quote. Abba Verman is pointing to an aporia in our thinking and time sense, that in our anticipation of midnight or the terminal, we fail to understand that the terminal is already here, right? Defining our relationship to terminality's other interminability or repetition. And so my figuration of the interminability, right, is marked by this similar contradiction as that bad infinity is, right? That the interminable sets itself over and against the terminal, embedding the end point inside each point in the series while also leading to the piling up of time over and over, right? Indeed, cat catastrophe and its interminability is defined by, like I said, a stubborn contradiction, right? Of its assumption as the harbinger of the end while also failing to ever bring about the end via this persistent delay, right? This contradiction in which the end is embedded in and defines the interminable catastrophe is what I'm signaling, right, via this analogy. Now, the question that remains is, right, to put it otherwise, what if we forego this anticipatory language to borrow from McKittrick, right? Mm -hmm of midnight on the clock, of time running out, of the end on a near horizon, and instead recognize that we inhabit the end in every repetition, that the end is actually all around us. Would the panic be replaced by another kind of action or thinking? Right? What if we were to understand we don't actually have to wait for the end, but that's the very presence of the end which propels the repetition? Right? The other key feature of the interminable for me, which is something that of course is missed by Hegel's idea of the bad infinity is not the only thing that's missed, right? Is that of the interruption, right? Because we know that nothing, not capitalism, not climate change, not fascism, nothing is an historical inevitability, right? Everything is vulnerable to interruption, right? And so my conception of the interminable is also defined by this propensity for interruption, for being thrown off course, right? It's vulnerability via attempts to break the meter, 
to re-invoke Kamal Brathwaite, right? So against the breathless numbers, the cruel mathematics that Albert Camus wrote so, so beautifully about, the piling up of numbers, this, the assumed unbreakability of the interminable, the meter must and does break, right? What if we break with the meter, right? And instead inhabit the word of les damnés, so that the world itself may begin again and again, setting itself over and against, but from these Adamic gestures of black radical thinkers and doers, right? What's interminable is not a foregone conclusion. The story can be told differently. And the meter that underpins catastrophe and durable repetitions often does break. Thank you. Okay, now my, my, my mic is on so now I can hear me clap for everybody. Um, that was incredible. Yes, the interrupters, that is the black radical tradition, interrupting this catastrophe. Um, okay, so let me, let me enter this way because um, I have a million questions. So let me just do this. Let me lay out three different questions and then just lay them out and then we'll just open up a discussion among us. Um, and some of these questions may feel like they're for one person, but they're really for everyone. Um, so let me just start with uh, a question. Really, it, it, it's kind of inspired by the title of the panel itself, you know, what the twilight says. And, you know, from the essay, uh, Walcott's talking about the, you know, the, 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 the fear, his, his own fear in some ways, of turning suffering into spectacle, you know, romanticizing the poor. And what's central to all of your work is this question of death. And we're living in a, in a moment where, it's not even new, but we're living in this moment where kind of a kind of hyper spectacality of death. Um, death is, is itself a kind of a spectacle, um, black death in particular. And I'm wondering sort of to build on that, what does this tell us? What do you what can what what are your response to the way in which whether it's social social media or, or whatever representations of death have become spectacle? And how is it tied to, or rather, more precisely, is the practice of enumeration another form of spectacle? You know, the death by numbers, cruel mathematics. Is it, you know, something that sometimes we embrace as a way to kind of prove suffering? Um and yet, you have such a brilliant critique of it. That's one question. Um, the next question really is about about fascism. And you know, I love uh, essay when you talked about you know fascism, anti-fascism in some ways as a kind of new arsenal of resistance. And everyone, all three of you, are talking about fascism in some form or another. Um, the recognition that colonialism, you know, isn't just a precursor of fascism, but it is the structure of fascism. Uh, it is the, the prologue and the epilogue. Um, so I want to just get some thoughts about, about fascism. Can we develop a kind of politics of fascism that actually resists uh, what S.A. is talking about with respect to, the, to murderous inclusion? Can there be? I mean, given the way we think about it, how do we think about fascism beyond this, the borders of, of the United States where it's like right in our face? Um, how do we think about fascism that recognizes genocide, including reproductive violence, as part of this fascism um, construction? Uh, and then finally, um, and this is just my little thing, I, I the, one of the things, um, Zoe, that you um, didn't have time to talk about was the more recent um, uh, legal action that failed in U.S. courts around the Herrero and Nama uh, claims to genocide. And you know, one of the things that I think all of you could could respond to is the fact that you know W.E.B. Du Bois, you know, at the time of the formation of the United Nations was trying really hard to get the UN to declare colonialism as a crime against humanity. And if that had happened, <laughs> we'd, we'd, be, we'd be having a different conversation. I mean, it would, this is all preceding the Convention on Genocide. So having said that, 
And given the absence of colonialism in our current discourse, and, I, and I'll give you, a, and don't be mad at me about saying this for people who are in the audience, but you know, Isabel Wilkerson writes this book called Cast and has a chapter, uh, sex chapters on the Nazis and never once ever acknowledges um, German colonialism, um, the genocide, and then kind of takes from it this sort of creates this narrative in which the U.S. is the source of, of, of Nazi ideology. So I'm wondering if you could kind of respond to, once again, another erasure of German of Germans genocide in Africa. That book, for me at least, is another example of erasure, uh, and and it's another example of the erasure of of colonialism from the from the way a lot of us, not you, but a lot of us within this this country, have been thinking about, you know, the structure of racism and racist violence. So those are the things I'm just going to put on the table. You don't have to answer them all, but just just things to talk about. And could jump in any time. Cool. That way you can start since you since you made the first sound. <laughs> oh. Um. I yeah, yeah. I I um have only basically been reading about German colonialism for the past like two years, and I feel incredibly vindicated by your comment about, you know, the kind of constant placement of Germany as this, as this like reformed nation state after this singular horrific event that it committed in the middle of the 20th century to now become this beacon of unification and reconciliation. You know, Germany just offered Namibia a 10 million euro settlement as a kind of, um, reparation for genocide, which is like, I'm pretty sure more than one celebrity makes 10 million euros from like a particularly successful film. Um, it's been so interesting to see, you know, to, to your point about this acknowledgement and this kind of refusal to acknowledge also about Du Bois, um, he was a, like a, like a Germanophile you know, when he was praising Germany's agricultural reforms in, in West Africa, you know, he talks about the successes in Togo and in Cameroon and just suddenly German East Africa and, and, and the forced um, agricultural policy of growing cotton, which led to the, the brutal suppression in the Maji, um, the Maji Maji uprisings, doesn't exist. You know, suddenly the, you know, the 80% of the Herero and half of the Nama who were murdered so Germans could access land, arable land that's like the size of Connecticut, um, suddenly doesn't exist. And so there's so much really fascinating exceptionalism that goes into the way that Germany gets understood, even though so much of the way that Germanness is constructed, like revolves around anti-blackness, you know, not just um, the colonial encounter, but then, you know, the French occupation of the Rhine and how this 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 black horror becomes fundamental to the way that German cre Germany creates itself um, after World War One, and it's it, it's very frustrating to me, right? Because it, it speaks to this understanding of genocide, um, and it doesn't have to be this way, but as a, as a, as a, as a hierarchy, as a ranking, right? Like like you know, the, the the first genocide really worth recognizing, you know, it's it's not so much that I think that anyone particularly cared about what happened to Jewish people in Europe, but because there was this, you know, as Cesar says, this application of colonialist technologies to European peoples. Um, and this set the precedent for how we understand genocide, right? It becomes about the individuals to be prosecuted, as opposed to this long process of coloniality, which you know, depending on who you ask, and, and I believe this, is necessarily genocidal. Genocide is not as uncommon as Raphael Lemkin wants to make it out to be. Um, and I think that, that this desire to make it this anomaly 
is is how you know international human rights law international law really structures itself as this you know in this refusal to to encounter colonialism because if all of a sudden you know if Du Bois succeeded and if colonialism were a crime against humanity you know the we charge genocide petition would have the reception would have looked completely different as well as the petition that he sought um, to try to to, to to petition to the United Nations as well. I guess I'll jump in on a couple of the questions. Um, so on the first question, um, so one thing that I talk about in my manuscript is how there are certain thinkers that have given us the kind of disavowed bedrock. It's a bedrock, but but the bedrock itself has to be disavowed in order for it to stabilize what our current kind of master script or order is, right? And one of those thinkers is, of course, Immanuel Kant, right? And so part of this kind of logic, right, of cool mathematics that I try to tease out is um, two aspects of Kant's thinking, right? So in his, you know, treaties on perpetual peace, right? His, the whole idea of the cosmopolitan right to hospitality, the reason why there are so many restrictions, right? There are so many um, uh, conditions to it is because, right? He actually argues that because of the spherical shape of the earth, there's a limited amount of physical space, right? Like there is not physically enough space. And that's why this cosmopolitan right to hospitality has to have certain circumscriptions, right? So there's a way that this kind of logic, right, of human beings actually representing an excess, a burden, right, or a, something that must be placed as antagonistic to the earth itself, right? And we know which ones, <laughs> you know, are placed inside of this antagonism. But what's even more interesting, I think, right, is Kant's um, theorizations concerning the sublime, right? And he has, um, uh, there are two forms of sublime, right? There is the dynamic and there's also the mathematical sublime. There isn't that much of a difference, right? But they both generate a similar feeling, right? This awe, this inability to actually approximate in our own kind of whatever verbiage we have, right? That it exceeds whatever language we have. And so we are left with this feeling. We're burdened with this feeling of awe. And he says it, it includes hurricanes, it includes uh, you know, volcanic eruptions, all the, the depths of the ocean, things that we can try and guesstimate and make sense, but they don't actually make sense because we don't have the, have those things to measure it by, right? So my, I argue, right, that the spectacularization of violence has, on the one hand, to do, of course, right, with this idea that people seek pleasure in seeing Black people die. But it also is attached, I think, to this propensity for the sublime that we have, right? And the other thing is, right, that we don't have the sublime without that which against which the sublime renders itself cohesive, right, which is the ordinary and the dull, the boring, the low hum of everyday violence, right? So without this kind of daily brutal calculus that happens, right, you don't actually appreciate the sublime, right? There are two sides to the same coin, but the preoccupation with catastrophe is often a preoccupation with the sublime, right? And then we let that which defines the sublime, which is the ordinary, off the hook, right? And then we don't leave space in our minds for both of those things at the same time, right? Um, and so, yeah. And then on the question of fascism and colonialism, I think it's I think it's really interesting, right? Because I think what Zoe's pointing to is precisely what M. Zazier talks about, right? He says at the end of formal renunciation, there's Hitler, and he cites all these liberal humanists, right? That the renunciation itself is the same disavowal which stabilizes the fascism, right? And allows it to to emerge and re-emerge, right? At the end of formal humanism, there is Hitler, right? So that liberalism itself um, is uh, that kind of intimate bedfellow right, of, of fascism. And of course, this is something that George Padmore also, we were talking about this right before we got on the call, right, George Padmore in Pan-Africanism or Communism, he actually shows how Stalin coming from the left, right, and, you know, these European fascists coming from the right managed to find one commonality, which is that of colonial domination, right? That's one thing they could certainly agree upon, and that's why colonial domination is, again, the disavowed bedrock. It's there, but it has to be disavowed in order for whatever is on the surface to make itself cohesive, be it left, right, what have you. Um, that was very long-winded, but just wanted to... <laughs> okay, but, but, but before you end, before you end, just one last word about what does the last thing you said mean for the moment? You know, yeah. for, for like right now, I'm just curious. And, and of course, yeah. for everyone, but right now, given 
you know, th- there was something about that moment in the 30s and 40s where, you know, you have states trying to resolve their own, you know, economic crisis, problems of overproduction, problems of all kinds of problems through um, these state forms of repression and enclosure. And mm-hmm. so you, you could see that. And also at the moment when formal colonialism is is contested. Now we're at a moment where we have sort of, I don't know if it's different. Maybe it's not. I, I would just love to hear your thoughts. <laughs> Well, I mean, I think I think there are definitely certain parts that are instructive for the for the current moment. I think one of the most obvious things, right, is that liberalism is not actually an opposing force to fascism, right? It's actually that thing it, that they need each other, liberalism and fascism, right? They are, you know, staring at each other and rendering again each other cohesive as they, you know, gaze upon one another, liberalism and fascism, right? Which means that liberal modes of accommodation are just, they're not only not going to work, right? We have to, this is the thing about liberalism, right? The way that it sticks and moves, right? At the On the one hand, it presents itself as the solution to the problem while at the same time co- concealing the very violence that it perpetuates, right? Okay. So this is the devious nature of liberalism, right? Okay. And then we get got, we get hoodwinked, bamboozled, right? Um, because, and that's part of what I'm trying to do with the interminable catastrophe, right? Is that the point at which we enter, the description of the problem itself matters, right? Okay. Because if we get that wrong, right? we also get caught up in this repetition of setting ourselves over and against the same thing over and over again, right? And it's not that liberalism, and and I'm not saying that liberalism is getting us closer to the end, but what I'm saying is liberalism, right, is a burden. We're actually burdened by liberalism in this repetition that we can't actually do what we want to do, right? Um, And I think, yeah, I don't know if that was what you're looking for, but... (laughs) even if it wasn't what he was looking for, those are the facts. And so I want to maybe piggyback a bit on that and say um, truly nothing because uh, Dr. Bedore Legger has already said it. But, you know, where we go, Padmore, Césaire, Allegra, we also have uh, generations and generations of an uh, sort of an obvious iteration that the retrenchment of liberalism into fascism fascism and vice versa um, speaks directly to... So to Robin's question about this current moment. And so that's that's sort of the approach that I take, which uh, historians might be mad about. Robin doesn't count, <laughs> even though he's definitely a historian. But, you know, it's not necessarily about the dates, but precisely to take seriously the conceit of the ongoing of these colonial formations, right? It's not like, you know, which I also um, tr- try to take seriously in my own um, work and where Blackness meets the sea when we're talking about, you know, the post-colonial, which post-colonial scholars have been taking seriously, right? The post and post-colonial, the post and post-liberal, the post and post-feminism, the post and post-blackness, and what actually, like, wither the post and what is it that we're doing here? And where is our intervention in terms of a temporal, spatial uh, uh, marker? But uh, but it is precisely, again, Padmore, <laughs> Césaire, Allegra, many, many others, right? We have already, we have been here before and we will continue to be here. And so when we talk about this moment, the only reason we are in a moment that we can name as this, this moment, is because people have not decided to ethically and accountably engage in the this. Does that make sense? We have not ethically, well, not we, because I'm out here trying to do something different as are the other people on this call. But uh, when I say we, there's a mainstreaming. And obviously we are saying this in our particularity in terms of not one week ago, we have had uh, an ostensible democratic, I say that in quotes, I hope that's clear, US election, uh, where we are talking about uh, you know, sort of making it from someone, someone who was ostensibly fascist, ostensibly orange, ostensibly totalitarian, and there is something uh, better or otherwise. And that is a mainstreaming that I would really call on anyone who can hear my voice to resist and desist from pursuing because we've already been here before. Padmore is not today, but he is also today. Césaire is not our contemporary, but he is also our contemporary, right? We have been here before in terms of reckoning with, well, you know, the lesser of two evils argument. Even Arendt in all of her definite and demonstrative anti-blackness that Samuzi can speak to quite clearly, right? We've been here before 
poor. And we don't need to actually do that because we actually have other paths, other charts to not actually reinforce the liberalism that has already actually told us. It's not that it's subtle. It's not that it's unclear. It's not that murderous inclusion is not something that they have not already told us what it's about. It is actually that we are still seduced into it. And that for me is the question. And so I technically didn't answer all the other questions, but really that's, I just really would like to name this in the US at least um, for this particular, this moment being this geopolitical space that is Churchill Island, that is the US to say, We've been here before, we know what liberalism does. And it's not the same thing to say those who can vote, who have not been disenfranchised historically and presently, who have not been um, sort of uh, extricated from the possibility of the pseudo-democracy that America itself prescribes and reinscribes, but rather to say, we know better. And therefore we can, all, we can just do better. And it really is as simple as that. It's not a pie in the sky theoretical argument. Right. It's actually a concrete directive that we can just take up that mantle and, and say no more. And that is actually right. okay. Right. Mm -hmm. and, and you know, you're so right about this because you know, this is sort of the follow up question. You know, we're in a situation where, you know, historically, anti fascism has often been about a two step solution that is, the one step defend liberalism. The two-step is, you know, once you defend it, and then we move forward to doing the work we started doing. And whereas a lot of people behind the anti-fascist front have actually been themselves proponents of liberalism. And you're right, liberalism actually does erase, e evade, um, mm -hmm. hide the violence that it's... I mean, this is why Du Bois made the point about British colonialism you know, he, he he was saying. I mean, this is later after after he defended <laughs> after he defended Germany, um, but later he comes to his senses and sense, and and says, you know, don't don't in in the world in Africa. He says, like, don't don't give me don't tell me about um, a British liberalism and liberal traditions. You know, given its colonial holdings and its domination, its violence, let alone the uh, the fact that so many weapons of mass destruction were experimented on the Sudanese you know, by the British. So there's a, there's a lot there. But my question is, um, why do we keep going for the okie doke? You know, why is it, you know, what what is it that keeps yeah. doing that? And are there any models out that could actually make the leap to say that, you know what, our job right now is not necessarily to, to defend uh, a regime that we that's waging war on us right now, that's preparing to wage war on us, is doing so right now. What are there models around the world? Are there alternatives? I mean, what's you know, are there struggles in Brazil or Italy or elsewhere that could be models for trying to move beyond a a kind of defense of liberalism as the anti-fascist position? I mean, I'll go first just because like my brain is swimming, but I think part of the reason why we keep falling for the okie doke is that we are so afraid to move on from paradigms that are no longer serving us properly. Right. And I think that when people, when we say we need to move on from certain paradigms, people think we have to like liquidate our entire history, right? That we can't actually keep an idea of them in the back of our heads, but move on from that, which is not serving us. Right. And the thing about liberalism is it's hungry. It's a monster. It, it cannibalizes everything. It will eat up whatever you put in front of it. So if you put black feminism in front of it, it will feed on that. Right. And if our current paradigms concerning black feminism, right, for example, are ones, right, that hoist and hold up a certain kind, like re-territorialize a certain kind of problem, it's okay to move on from certain kinds of feminism. It's perfectly okay to move on from that which doesn't serve us. But we're so afraid to do it, to make that leap, to draw from Fanon. And that's what lets us go for the, oh, that's what gets us hoodwinked, bamboozled, right? Is our, our unwillingness to shed or unburden ourselves of that which is no longer useful to us. It's still inside of us, we're still people, right? But we don't wanna shed it, you know? And I think like, that's also part of what I'm trying to do with the push, because when I say, are we prepared? We been pushing at the limit of the Anthropocenic frame, right? We've been pushing up and tugging up against that limit. Clearly what we're doing exists in this kind of fluvia that exceeds the frame, 
are we prepared to actually now cross the threshold and step outside of it? And I think that's the question we can ask about all kinds of frameworks that are no longer serving us, right? Or no longer meeting our political demands or perhaps never met our political demands in the way we wanted to and that's okay, right? I believe in what Du Bois said about the splendid failure. It's okay, right? When a paradigm fails, it still teaches us something, right? But it might not serve us in the way that we need to, right? And then I think what is so, I think important also to remember is I think sometimes we get caught up in making epistemological claims on behalf of people instead of actually thinking about what people are doing and saying about themselves, right? So we'll see what's happening. We'll be like, oh, this is a clear example of syndicalism. This is X, Y, but like people have their own way about talking about themselves, right? So we get caught up in making all kinds of epistemological claims where we shouldn't, right? And then the last thing is, I mean, this is something I mean, Zoe, you'll speak to this better than I can, right? Because this is something that black anarchists do better than anyone. The idea is like you get it how you live it, right? How you actually live your life, right? Is is like if you are living your life in such a way that renders the state superfluous, right? Like if you're engaging in mutual aid, if you're taking care of people, right? If you are um, working every day in terms of political education, mental health, self-defense, what have you, right? And none of those things require surveillance by the state then you are getting it how you live it. That is something to be, you know, to, to be learned from, right? And I think the more and more we render the state superfluous itself, the better, I mean, this is, and this is why I find, you know, Cedric Robinson's con conception of like the anti-political tradition so important, right? Because it lends itself to this. And when I think about Sudan, right, the reason why what happened happened, and you know, the counter-revolutionaries did take power, right? So it's not over yet, but that break that happened, it happened because, for like eight months, nobody went to work. Nobody went to, not a single school was open, right? The banks were closed, right? People completely withdrew from the state itself was rendered superfluous. People withdrew entirely, right? That's actually what it takes to talk with dictatorship, right? Is now, are we prepared, right? To unburden of ourselves of all the kind of psychosocial and material attachments to the state. Are we prepared to make the state superfluous to itself? I don't know, because the left has certain attachments to the state too. But I don't know if that's too spicy for this combo. But <laughs> it's not too spicy. I'm like a um, I hate to make constant kind of reference and comparison to Germany, um, but other people do it, so I'm gonna do it too. I think that what you know, we 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 use Germany as this model of the United States, quote unquote, backsliding into fascism. But if anybody read you know, the prison letters of George Jackson or black radicalism, we would understand that the roots of American fascism come from constitutionalism. They come from a social contract that is um, inherited within it, has, has this notion of inequity, you know, has this idea of, you know, there are groups of people who are never, who will never be citizens and who will never be a part of the social contract, which means that at any point in time, other people can also get their citizenship revoked and other people can also be removed from the social contract. There is no stability in this idea of citizenship. And, you know, instead of, you know, searching for the Reichstag fire moment, like the moment where fascism like kicks into gear, I think that the much more interesting moment is the Allied occupation of the Rhine, where you know Germany creates this international spectacle and 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 pandemonium around the Black Horror, around the idea that these black soldiers will have are are not only you know um, and all of the tropes, all of the familiar tropes pop up, right? That like France has teamed up with Jews to use black people to destabilize not only the 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 Weimar Republic but all of Europe. Um, that the, 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 these black soldiers will rape the women, you know, all, all of these, all of these familiar tropes, right? And it's not, the thing that I find the most interesting about that is it's not just the German right, right? Like it's this transsectarian international coalition of whiteness, right? Across the spectrum, it's liberals, it's fascists, it's basically only communists that are just like, hmm, hmm, um, but that all, all of these groups understand blackness fundamentally as a threat to, to, to white life, to white civilization. And as we think about it in the United States, you know, BLM is that horror. 
the, the, the defund the police, abolish the police, is that black horror, this horror that threatens to destabilize American order as it, as it fundamentally, you know, as it compels us to envision life outside of anti-black, anti-indigenous, xenophobic, homophobic, transphobic, whatever, carceral, carceral forms in this country. Um, and to, to Bedour's point, you know, about, you know, the, to, about black anarchism, the thing that was so deeply compelling about Wayward Lives is what I immediately recognized as anarchism, but it is not anarchism, right? It is not called anarchism because people did not insist, well, there, I'm sure there were pe people who did, maybe, but, you know, people did not primarily insist on naming themselves as anarchists, as anything in the in, in the creation of these social forms, of these networks, of this mutual aid, of this complete disregard for private property. And the thing for me that is so compelling, um, the, the, the fundamental difference for me about the uh, mm, the fundamental difference between black anarchism and the kind of white orthodox anarchism is that black people refuse to preoccupy themselves with the question of citizenship because black people understand that they will never be citizens. And so in the creation of, of these political forms, of these political ways of life, right, they are always already eluding surveillance and, and refusing the logics of the state and these respectable ideas that would, um, uh, that would endear them to the state because they know that blackness precludes citizenship. And that to me is, 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 is what is incredible and inspiring and terrifying, right? To, to, it's like, I'm not gonna call it like outlaw stuff, but it's like, it's kind of this outlaw way of, of existing, of, of forming social networks, of, of enacting these networks of, of care. Um, and they're incredibly dangerous and they're incredibly exhilarating. And, and the thing that is the most important to me is that it is, there are things that we already do. They aren't, there are things that we can always afford to do better, right? But there are things that are so fundamental to black life, right? The way that we do kinship, the way that we, you know, all of the things. Um, essay. That's great. Essay. Yeah. All right. Just like Bedore, Bedore had something to say and I'm just okay. going to stand. So. No, no, no. It's Unrelated. Oh, don't do this. Okay. Well, you know, I hear, I, I hear what I, I'm, I'm enthralled. So I'm, I'm trying to talk through my bearings as I try to grasp them. But um, uh, I want to maybe, I want to like hinge on, an, on like an agon that I'm experiencing in, in what, in what Zoe is talking about and what Bajora has talked about um, in terms of like black people are doing this. And so I want to like maybe bring that into my context. But first, to sort of like, you know throw some of the energy off of me while I am one of the faces on the screen. I want to read something that Dr. Robin D.G. Kelly has said. So um, in, in, in conversation, it says, echoing Aime Césaire's famous claim that the poetic knowledge is born in the science silence of scientific knowledge, Black studies scholars have explored the emancipatory potential of poetry to revolt against the status quo, status quo? Uh, and anticipate radically different features. Robin Kelly, Dr. DG, uh, insists that poetry is, quote, a revolutionary mode of thought and practice because, quote, it urges us to improvise and invent and recognizes the imagination as our most powerful weapon. And so I want to just stop there. Uh, obviously, I will gush about Dr. Kelly for days, but uh, I want us to take that seriously. And as, uh, you know, as, as an answer that uh, obviously Robin has talked through, written through, you know, thought through music about various media, right, where we are, we are, like, I, I am readily, me, myself, and I are readily able to answer the question of why we fall for the okie doke because we don't take poetry seriously, because we don't take music seriously, because we don't take creative invention and improvisation seriously. And so I am here to say we are going to continue to play ourselves. We will, whoever the we is, right? And I also want which po poetry and poetic knowledge as a Sarah Hales, also calls us to do, right? It's not just trans people that care about a pronoun, right? But poets care about this, right? And the we that we are conjuring in my utterance of that sentence and the we that gets hailed when we say we or when we say black people, right? Whoever gets hailed or caught up in that net, whoever catches those strays are definitely getting the okie doke when we don't take seriously the things that have been offered to us. And for me, that is just the point blank answer, right? And so 
when uh, and I and I think about that and why I talked about Zoe's work, right? Like w when Zoe's talking about like black people, black anarchists already know we have been here before. When I and my work said we've been here before. You know, Bajor and I talked about the language of preparation, which I find like super interesting, right? From like from 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 Bajor's perspective and then from mine. Like, are we actually prepared? That's not rhetorical. That's not like poetic license. Are we literally prepared to do what it actually takes for us to overthrow the conditions that we have endured for centuries? And the answer is actually yes if we listen, right? For me, that 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 is actually not um it's not a question of are we able or are you know it's not a question of capacity because for me blackness in and of itself is a capacious thing and so when i talk about the black mediterranean or in my own scholarship or like living in that space it can it just is one of those like enduring and ongoing questions agons and also frustrations when um unlike you know which is not the entirety of Zoe's work, but the, the corpus of talking about like black anarchists, black people, you know, know to endure and evade and like do this kind of work when I'm also confronted with people who I, I love. And I mean that philosophically, politically, affectively uh, in the space that we're calling Italy, who also are wearing like, you know, Nike produced t-shirts that says, Anch'io sono l'Italia, I am also Italy. When I look at it and say, but why, sis? Or like, you know, why? why? <laughs> I guess I guess to put it more intellectually, wherefore? You know, why Why is that the case? Why is Italy the thing that needs to be reified in this moment? Why can you not also be Black? Why is there not an otherwise capacity? Again, bringing in Ashan's work, bringing in Tiffany King's work, bringing in so many people who have thought through and really took it, taken seriously the concept of an otherwise capacity, which is Black emancipation and liberation. Why not that direction? Why in your struggles are we taking on this, you know, repeating myself this from Jin Haritabor and this murderous inclusion? Do I want to be in a nation state? We, again, in the U.S. where I regrettably live, there is there was just this election that still feels like ongoing. And there's this conversation about the coup that is, just to be very clear, is definitely happening. I, I am coerced and seduced into this conversation, regardless of whether I can or cannot vote in this Babylon place, to sort of take seriously the terms and conditions that, regardless, oppress us. Regardless, says Dr. Bedour Allegra, either are liberal or fascist, and therefore the two two sides of the same very same coin that are going to lead to our murders. Right? Do we need to instead, like, sort of think through what has also been produced and rendered possible? And for me. Obviously, is also you know a practicing and performing poet, but before well before that, well well before that, someone who leaned in to why we're called notes from the notes from the twilight today, right? Derek Walcott, I may Cesaire, right? Like lean into the poetics and possibility of black potential that says we actually don't need to be retrenched. We can think otherwise, and not that we can in like a future present sort of tense in a grammatical sense, but we've already been doing that. Let's lean in, right? Let's actually make that work for us because it has not, the, the, the alternatives are indeed not alternatives, but the very liberal hyphen fascist productions that we have already endured and we know do not work. It's not an okie doke for me then, even though I'm still sort of conscripted and co-opted right. into that project. I say this, right, as a professor, as a, you know, like, like forged into the middle class as I am now, right? But we 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 know better and we can do better. And so I hope that was coherent, um, oh, but we it, can just like leave it at you, that. You, you all are, are like on fire, on fire, I tell you. Um, I, I, I have these questions here from the, from the audience, so I don't want to ignore them. So I'm going to throw... Uh, one out for anyone who wants to take it. And in fact, I'll one at a time. So this one is, um, how can we interrupt the successful social construction of fear against refugees in core or Western nations through the lens of catastrophe or interminable catastrophe? That's the question. Um, so I haven't tested out the, the theory in other arenas yet. I'm still working on it in this arena, but I think it can, I think it, I think it has the potential to kind of move around, um, well, but, and I think it's because of some of the basic assumptions about what catastrophe is, right? And I think what is, you know, and it's so interesting because while both of you were talking, I was thinking about how, what underpins, um, genocide, uh, crisis, catastrophe, right? If we're talking about black life, what underpins all of this? right, is I think Sylvia Winter's understanding of the liminal is super important, right? Because 
she doesn't think about the liminal necessarily as a transitory space, as an unresolved space or an in-between space, but actually for her, the liminal is the bedrock upon which the whole entire episteme rests, and it's not visible. You don't see it. But also, right, that means that when the bedrock moves, everything moves with it, right? So there's actually a way that the liminal becomes politicized in her way. So if we carry this into other predicaments, right, that what is, right, the disavowed bedrock upon that thing, what, what it rests. So if we mm-hmm. have this refugee crisis, what is that kind of disavowed bedrock upon which it rests? And that's where we have to actually address um, the solution, the problem, the naming of the thing itself. Um, and I think that and this might sound, you know, abstract or what have you, but I'm still working through it. Um, is that that refugees experience? I think more so than in any other example, this narrative condemnation, right? That that she talks about, right? That the narrative condemnation, um, that the actual physical condemnation doesn't precede the narrative condemnation itself, right? That the narrative condemnation is what propels the discourse forward and forward and on and on, right? And that that is what needs to be undone. Right, is the narrative condemnation, which is why Kamau's insistence that we break the pentameter is so important, right? This is where po- poetry becomes so instructive, right? Because undoing that narrative condemnation, we have to break the meter, right? We have to interrupt the meter, right? That propels the narrative in such a way, right? Uh, Derek Walker also, you know, his idea of a damnic naming, right? This idea that like, we don't have to necessarily necessarily get rid of these old words and concepts, but we can make them new again, right? Like we can take them and make them new again, right? So, but in any case, we have to address the kind of liminal foundations of a problem. And that is always already a kind of narrative construction, right? So when it comes to refugees, right, we must undo the narrative we condemn status. That is first and foremost. And yeah. Anyone else want to jump in on this question? No? Um, Okay, thank you so much. So the next question, um, I'm just going to read it. It says, do you agree with Daniel uh, Goldhagen that eliminationist rhetoric is a necessary condition for genocide? If so, how do we confront such rhetoric in daily life in the United States of America? So first of all, yes. I mean, it's 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 completely necessary, right? Because how do you how 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 were the Germans able to proceed with even if it wasn't secret the sterilization of the Rhinelander bastards, if not this massive international propaganda campaign about or, or you know not even the propaganda campaign, right? The decades, the centuries of eugenic science that positioned blackness as the number one pollutant. Of, of of the German nation of of Europe of 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 white purity, um, there is there is not genocide without manufactured consent, right? The 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 genocide of indigenous people today is is ongoing through the way that we justify the legitimacy of the United States. Mm-hmm. Eliminationist rhetoric doesn't necessarily just look like Trump bellowing on and on about you know, Mexican rapists, right? It also looks like the way that the nation state is naturalized and that the nation state's monopoly on legitimate forms of violence is is naturalized such that self-defense is rendered criminal. Um, and I think that, you know, for me, one of the most important confrontations of eliminationist rhetoric is, um, you know, chipping away and abolishing the carceral state because inherent to kind of racial capitalism and to carcerality is this idea of disposability. It's this idea that there are people who are innocent, that there are people mm-hmm. who are guilty, um, and thus there are people who it is necessary for you know the survival, for the thriving, for the well-being of the nation, which is you is is eugenic, right? That those people need to be incarcerated, that those people need to be deported, that those people need to be. Um, if we're talking about kind of the functioning of racist algorithms to be shadow blocked, to have their um, accounts frozen and suspended. It is all of these different ways of, of, of suppressing speech um, at, at the kind of quote unquote lowest form and at the highest form, it is this idea, this, this perpetuated idea that there are any forms of life not worthy of living, mm-hmm. um, not worthy of supporting. Um, I even see, you know, we've even seen this eliminationist rhetoric in 
the response to the pandemic, this idea mm -hmm. initially that we could literally like sacrifice our grandparents because they don't have that much time left or the this initial idea that quote the only people who will be harmed are disabled and 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 people who are chronically ill and in that you know we know the very very long history of sterilization of euthanasia programs for people who have disabilities chronic illnesses whatever um when we saw the um when the news about the 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 eugenic fund at UC Berkeley came out um, relatively recently, which had been there since, what, 1975, and the School of Public Health has just been dispersing money from it every year, is this idea that it is, yeah, that it is incredibly hard to disavow eugenics, because everything is eugenics. And it sounds really hyperbolic, but whenever we think about the, and this will be, you know, getting into the kind of like uh, medicine kind of focus of whatever my sociology work is. It's like whenever you start talking about the transferal of traits, whenever you start talking about inheritance and outcomes, you know, and whenever you start thinking about people at some people and some traits and some ideas as being more valuable than others, like you start to enter into these eugenic logics, which in capitalism, when we are trying to maximize productivity, everything becomes eugenics. Um, every person becomes understood and evaluated as far as their productivity, either to whiteness, to, to the, the, the capitalist machine, um, to whatever. And so, you know, in, in my understanding of how we confront it, it is all of these oppositions to racial capitalist forms, the prison system, the police structuring, borders. It's everything that seeks to kind of, to kind of separate and confine. Um, yeah, I, I mean, yeah. <laughs> okay, that's great. So um, there's actually another genocide question, but I'm going to save that for next. Uh, but before that, there's a question. Any thoughts on Caribbean leaders, for example, Mir Motley, uh, facing, the, facing down the barrel of climate change? How do you all think of crisis, catastrophe, and genocide in relation to the Caribbean? And I know all of you have something to say about that. I'm sure. Essay, you go first. I'll go second. <laughs> that's a that's a choice, and because we're all on camera, I'm happy to do that. Um, I will. Um, I want to be honest that I don't. Well, I want what I want to say. My impulse is to say I don't understand the question when I rebuke it. But um, that uh, to be clear to the asker. Um, and to everyone is because uh, when people say the Caribbean and then something as massive, ecological, untold, historic as climate change, I really want to know as a Jamaican and Jamaican citizen, how sway, that's an ancient African um, phrase, of course we know, right? Like what, what do you mean the Caribbean? What all is the Caribbean to do? <laughs> like what are we, what are we meant to offer to this crisis? And again, um, hubristically drawing from my own work when I talk, you know, when, and Benny Means and, and many other Robinsons, when we're talking about the crisis as this turning point and this real reckoning, what is the Caribbean truly made to reckon with? The history of our colonial legacy? Fam, we're already doing that, right? Beloved, we're already working through it. And so uh, I want to maybe name in those sorts of moments that the, the actual, I, I want to challenge, I guess, is what I'm really saying, the, the premise undergirding the question, right? It's not what is the Caribbean doing? It's not what South Asia is doing. It's not what Hawaii is doing. It's not, you know, it's not what the indigenous people struggling to get their own sovereignty recognized on Turtle Island are doing. It's not what Puerto Rico is doing, who I realize has recently narrowly voted for statehood into this Babylon place we're calling the American empire, but rather what is it that these colonial forces that continue to impede and on go and do, endure what are they doing? Because for me, it's not meant for the people who have already been trying to resist, right? As a Jamaican uh, and with definite Jamaican chauvinism probably implied, right? There's this history of marinage, this history of liberatory practices. There's this history of what I was saying earlier from Cesare, from Padmore, from many, from Robinson and many others of this otherwise that has been offered, right? It's an offering, it's a generosity right, to, uh, of this otherwise practice of liberatory freedoms, we've been given that. So my answer in terms of 
climate change, my answer in terms of uh, like carcerality, my answer in terms of liberalism is truly the same. This historic and abiding force that the Caribbean has already offered that has been constantly repressed by the other enduring liberal fascist models uh, that uh, the West continues to take up and insist upon instead. It's not the Caribbean's concern necessarily, right? It's the Caribbean's impact and the Caribbean's reckoning with something that we have not been <laughs> like the the arbiters of. Uh, so I I don't I don't know actually I guess there's a lot of words to say I do not know what the Caribbean is up to in terms of climate change. But I put to you I wonder what President-elect Joe Biden and Madam Kamala Harris are up to in terms of climate change. I would like to know what Sarkozy is up to in climate change. I want to know what people in Italy are up to in climate change. Homie Trudeau, what is he doing for climate change and not what Caribbean people are doing for climate change? Because we have been trying our best. We have otherwise cosmologies that we have been trying to offer and continuing to endure and they have not been reckoned with. And that is not on us. Check. And JT is doing nothing in Canada. That's, he's doing exactly that. Actually, he's building a pipeline and, you know, contributing to the problem significantly. Um, and, you know, I'm going to echo everything that SA just said and add just two things, right? The first is, right, that I'm basically arguing that we don't actually have anything called catastrophe until the New World Encounter, right, in the Caribbean. That that thing called catastrophe doesn't actually exist. And we assign the word catastrophe to things that don't actually mean catastrophe. They meant calamity. They meant other things that were being taken up in the kind of early modern empiricist and theological debates. But we don't actually get catastrophe, right? This marriage, right, of this cruel mathematics and the fatal liberalism of this territorial relation until the New World Encounter, right? So that it's on, it is, you know, that is the site, right? When Kamal says it's it's also an event and it's ongoing, the inauguration, right, of the catastrophic happens in the Caribbean and the inauguration of modernity, all kinds of things. This whole idea of a worldview, as Sylvia Winter tells us, right, comes from the Caribbean, right? And the question is less what, can the Caribbean do, but we actually have to grapple with what has been done to the Caribbean. Like, what have we done to the Caribbean, right? I think that is the question that has to really be asked, right? Because we know that the United States is the number one contributor to climate catastrophe and climate change, um, the military rather, right? We know that, that the Caribbean um, nations, they consume the least amount of energy and bear the most kind of you know, material effects and consequences of climate change. In fact, right, the Caribbean has been ecologically condemned, right? And it's not of its own making, right? So where did that condemnation come from? Who is responsible? We can't let that off the hook, right? Um, and yeah, that's all, that's all I'll say. <laughs> Oh, wait, we can't hear you. I'm muted. Yes, I'm muted. I, I said all kinds of things. I'm, actually, I, I don't have to take it back now. Um, so, the which may be the last question, we'll see. Um, uh, from my friend, Panasha Um This is for Zoe, though, of course, every question is open to everyone. Um, and the question is, Perhaps part of why we can erase colonialism from Germany's Nazi legacy is to do, uh, has to do with the fact that the predominant conception of fascism does not or perhaps cannot account for anti-blackness. That's the question. Wow. Um, all right, I'm gonna give this a try. I'm currently working on a chapter about this. So any any failures in this explanation will probably be replicated in this dissertation. So I think that what happens with the way that we conceptualize fascism, right? Like fascism as initiated by um, Nazism, never mind fascist Italy um, and its colonizing project. But let's pretend it started with Germany. Um, I think that part of the reason that we don't properly grapple and account for anti-blackness is because we actually have a fundamental misunderstanding of what anti-Semitism is. Mm. Um, it's, it's the fact that anti-Semitism has been, you know, so heavily tethered 
to to all kinds of criticisms of Israel in support of Palestine Palestinian solidarity that we don't understand anti-Semitism as a part of this long existing European colonial project um, that emerged out of the millennia of or the millennium of um, Judeophobia. Mm-hmm. And I think what's the most important thing in understanding how anti-Semitism functions is that, you know, anti-Semitism is a term that is coined in the mid 19th century. It is used to describe um, the, the, the making scientific the hatred of Jews in Europe, right? And so for understanding European race science, we can't not talk about anti-blackness because because it is anti-blackness that makes the European white. It is this turn away from enslaving Slavs and this turn towards the exclusive enslavement of Africans that makes Europeans white. And anti-Semitism then arises as this scientific articulation of of what the kind of white European nation is, the white European Christian nation is, right? So culture, religion, this fabricated understanding of blood and ethnicity all comprise um, what is then carried out in, in, in this Nazi genocide of Jews, of Roma and Sinti, of communists, of part, you know, other partisans of all of these other people. Um, so it is this it is this kind of production of exceptionalism that completely obscures all of these different scientific, social, cultural, political logics that go into how the other the others rather are othered in all of these colonial arrangements that then go on to um, construct Nazi fascism. Um, you know, I, I again, I hate to like talk about Germany. But it's like when they're talking about the, vi- the, 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 the crisis on the Rhine, one of the most important things to think about is the fact that Hitler literally writes in Mein Kampf that France and, and the Jews colluded to, to send the blacks to, to infiltrate, to destroy Europe. So there is this tethering of, of black people and of Jews, obviously of, of non non-black Jews, right? I mean, it's this, it's this kind of like this, this white Jewish figure in particular um, as being in cahoots in some way of, of like this animalistic murderous black kind of doing the raping and the pillaging and the infiltrating and the kind of behind the scenes figure of this powerful Jewish person that is orchestrating the downfall of Europe. It's an old canard that you can trace back to the, the, the protocols of the elders of Zion. So I think It's this very superficial understanding of what the Nazis actually did. It's this refusal to engage the fact that anti-blackness was such an important part of the building of German and all other empires. um, And the fact that all of these different racial otherings are co-constructed and they never, they like, that's, that's the thing is like, they never occur singularly. They're always occurring in like these simultaneous iterations over and over and over and over again. Um, and this kind of ahistoricism, this desire to exceptionalize Nazis, um, to, to remove all of Germany's encounters with anti-blackness that is producing this incredibly exceptional idea of how fascism is, is ha- how fascism happened in Germany and how fascism is, is occurring in the United States and across the kind of, you know, the Western and, and other, you know, non-Western world as well. You want to add to that? Because I had a follow-up to this, which is actually something that's relevant to all of you. And that is, um, I was thinking about uh, four years ago when the Movement for Black Lives put out its its first, you know, basically policy statement. And in that statement, they use the term genocide to describe the plight of Palestinians. And as a result, they got just massive backlash They were called anti-Semitic, funders pulled back, and the only organization, uh, aside from the, you know, stalwart black organizations within the movement for black lives that stood with them was JVP, was um, uh, Jewish Voice for Peace. And I'm wondering if, you know, in building on the last question, um, is there something, is there a relationship between this inability, which, which is your project is sort of about this, the inability to recognize um, the history of of anti-black genocide 
um, with the way in which um, the German gen genocide in the way it's framed um, is either mistakenly read as an analog to black anti-black genocide and therefore or just seen as uh, re re eliminating any sense of a kind of memory or counter memory of of the anti-black genocide, which, you know, everyone is basically dealing with the, the catastrophe. Um, is there a relationship between these things? And, and does that shape in particular um, the failures of this liberal anti-fascism that we're that we've been we've been carrying for a very long time? You know, failure to recognize uh, anti-black racism, anti-blackness as structurally very much embedded in fascism itself. Hmm. So first I want to shout out JVP. <laughs> shout out JVP. Right. Um, yeah, it's, it's always so interesting to see the kind of the, the, the prickliness of, of, of attempting to kind of, conceptualize Palestine in whatever kind of necropolitical frame um, outside of the kind of unfortunateness mm -hmm. of the occupation, which we can all kind of agree is not good, but kind of nothing beyond that. Um, I really appreciate um, Michael Rothberg's work, Multidirectional Memory, mm -hmm. because he kind of refuses this this idea of the monopolization of, of victimhood or this monopolization of of the understandings of experiences of violence. Um, I really appreciate how he pushes and how he builds on other thinkers who are kind of pushing for this, this idea of, of co-constitutedness. Um, because if we're gonna make this criticism of the British empire, right, we can't not talk about the Balfour Declaration, mm -hmm. right? Like if we're going to talk about anti-blackness in the United States, if we're going to talk about, you know, British colonization of, of Rhodesia um, and, and talk about the border wars and how all of these different um, insurgent black liberation struggles were fighting simultaneously, you know, we can't not talk about the fact that, you know, settler colonization is international, mm -hmm. right? That felt that the United States was doing funny things and refusing to sanction that the Israeli government was sending drones and military technology and bolstering the apartheid regime in South Africa, as well as the Rhodesian government in, in um, you know, the black majority struggling for their freedom. Um, I think one of the real difficulties is, you know, in, in beyond the kind of, the kind of like these kind of fearful politics is this real poverty of internationalism, which I think accompanies this real refusal to engage colonization and how we understand fascism. Because if internationalism was, you know, our native tongue, then it, it, it wouldn't be so difficult to invoke um, struggles around the world and to invoke solidarities with people kind of naturally, right? Like it would be a kind of natural part of the way that we conceptualized ourselves um, in, in community and in relation um, with, with other people around the world. Right. So I think for me that that's a part that that's one of the biggest parts of the problem. Okay, um, I know our time is up. Does anyone want to say anything in the next fifteen seconds or closing? Thank you. Okay, well then let me thank all of you. I mean, you know, Zoe Samudzi for brilliant. Everyone's so brilliant. Um, S. A. Smythe, um, Dr. Bador Allegra. Apologize for messing up your name the first time. Um, and it's just such an honor. I know a lot of people learned a lot. Uh, and non, not only that, but people who could write really fast wrote down a number of texts that they're going to run and read now. Um, and if not, they can always contact you. Uh, and then thank you, of course, uh, to Haymarket for this opportunity. Uh, and, and hi, Eliza. It's good seeing you. And, and I guess that's it. So...
Thank, Thank you. you so much. Thank, Thank you so you. much. Um, I am sorry. It's not the last word, so feel free, Robin, to say something else. But it's not just a list of texts. But feel free to, you know, I'm just going to drop a privilege of Black Marxism by one Cedric Robinson, who would have been 80 years old this year. Feel free to start there. Dense text, small font, but um, we can get into it later. <laughs> Cheers. Exactly. Oh, by the way, there there will be a new edition of Black Marxism coming out. <laughs> Is this uh, a time? Okay, yes. air horn sounds. Can I? Am I allowed? Can I? Is that? No, yeah, yeah, yeah. It's good. So, so just so so people know, because I know our, our, we're going over time, but um, in I think in March or so, UNC yeah. Press is putting out a cheaper edition with uh, a a new, a wonderful afterward, and a n- brand new introduction by yours truly, uh, which actually tries to cover what happened over the last twenty years. Um, and also addresses some of these questions about like the critique of racial capitalism and the black radical tradition in ways. So make sure that even if you have the book, that when a new edition comes out, get it because it's gonna be it's it's gonna be like the bomb. That's so <laughs> exciting, Robert. I'm also super excited, especially the critiques around, you know, that it doesn't like attend to Africa or African studies of the continent in general. So I really look forward to you to giving that accurate historiography right. and making sure that we all know that Robinson actively and concertedly accounted for that space and for us to talk about it when it's published. See you in 2021. Yes. <laughs>